Hello and welcome to part four of this video series. This is the final video. This is the grand finale. Uh, this is where we're going to be talking about the control system design. I do not have any components in front of me this time because it's all done in the computer. So we're going to be talking about the swing up controller and then we'll get into the LQR controller design. And I'll also give a bit of a retrospective on, uh, you know, what I could have done better in the project, I think. So if you're still interested and you're still here, let's get into it. Right, so now that we have our Simulink model and it's a near perfect replica of our real world system, we can now look at designing our controllers. Uh, the first one I will get into is the swing up control. So I've taken this from a guy called Stefan Brock and this is the paper on it. I'll leave a link in the description as well. And what this does is it basically switches between, uh, it basically moves the cart between two positions, the X max position and the X min position, which you can configure and which I've done for my, for my, for my pendulum. And the reason that's useful is because when you have a short cart length, like what I have, it's, it's very important for you to have precise control over where it goes. And this, this method sort of allows you to do that. Whereas I didn't see this option in the, in the sort of, or I didn't see this for the, um, in the classical approach. So, so that's what this is doing. It's just basically switching the cart between these two positions. And then all this logic behind it is basically just telling it when, when is the optimal time to switch. And I didn't do all of, I, I wasn't sure what all of this was basically, but so what I, my, my, my control algorithm basically just takes that X ref position, which is either the X max or the X min, and it compares it to the current position with a, 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 a basically with a proportional control on the end of it. And so then I get a voltage command, which I then basically send into the DC motor. So how this, how this bit of logic works, I'll show you next. And basically from this, this sort of diagram, you can see the pendulum is in blue. And what happens is if the, it takes the angular velocity of the pendulum and when it's negative, as it is here, and once it is greater than this alpha best that we compute, which is a function of alpha max, uh, it will basically move the cart or change the reference to the X max uh, position. And then similarly for the other for the other side, it will basically wait until the angular velocity is then now uh, less than zero or negative and going in this direction, and the and the uh, and the theta angle is is less than this alpha best value. So once it crosses this green line, that's when it's going to then switch to this x min position. It's quite interesting this. So how this works, you obviously need to compute a lot of uh, parameters, <laughs> a few of them. And that is in order to compute this alpha best value. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a function of, of, of theta max. It's also a function of the pendulum uh, period and a function of the uh, time to accel for the cart to accelerate. So how I calculated the period is through a bit of programming experience and just basically just looking at the data as well. Uh, I noticed that there was only one time when it crossed that zero down position. Uh, there was only one instance where the current angle minus the previous angle was greater than 180. So you can imagine like if it was, let's say it was one, I measured it currently to be one degree and the previous angle was like 395 or something, right, so, sorry, 3, like 55. Then the absolute value of, of the current angle minus the previous angle is actually greater than 180. And when that happens, I basically just push it into the stack. And that's going to need to happen at least, that's going to need to happen three times, right, to actually compute the period. Because if you, if you remember what a sine wave looks like, when you compute the period, it'll cross that zero axis. It needs to cross it three times, and then you measure the, the, the last one, and you minus it from the first one, and that's what's happening here. So that's what I've done in software code, and it worked. Uh, the next one you need is the time to accelerate. So I've, I've basically, when I've measured the data, uh, when I've measured the cart position, I just looked at the data basically for when it, it, it actually didn't swing up and didn't work. I just looked at what this time uh, um, acceleration time was, just measured it from the data itself and used that value. Uh, the next one is the theta max, which isn't anything too special basically. I didn't apply any resets to this or anything like that because in theory, your, your theta max should only increase 
and keep increasing. So if you've done it correctly. So I just take the current angle, which is between zero and 360, and I wrap it. And then I just take the absolute value. And if the absolute value is greater than anything it saw previously, it'll just, uh, it'll make that the new maximum. So, so that's how the swing up controller effectively works. And we'll now move on to the LQR. So finally, we have arrived at the LQR controller design. I'll first just cover why it is we actually need an LQR controller versus say a standard PID controller. Now, with an inverted pendulum, we actually need to control two variables. We need to control the cart position and the pendulum angle, and we need to do that simultaneously. With a PID controller, we'll actually have to do this, we'll have to design two controllers, and we'll have to do this separately and independently of each other, right? Uh, PID is a single input, single output approach, uh, which means that when we, if we're going to try to control both cart position and pendulum angle with these two controllers, we actually to optimize the the control for the entire pendulum system. We actually have to optimize. We'll have to optimize six gains basically, uh, you know, one for each of the the gain parameters in the PID controller, and we'll have and so that will take a considerable amount of time and effort to do that. For an LQR control method, you, you will actually be synthesizing a controller that is optimized to control both parameters with one controller and you will this will not be done independently. They're actually, they'll actually be taken account by using a weight. So we can actually weight one or the other. And you can imagine that we do need to have tighter control on the pendulum angle uh, versus the cart position. We'd want the cart to be able to move around a little bit because if the cart is able to move around, we can then effectively uh, control the pendulum angle a lot more effectively, right? So that is the advantage of the LQR controllers. They are, uh, they are a lot more effective when you've got multiple parameters that you need to control. So how it looks is effectively, it's just the, it relies on full state feedback, uh, which is the full, all the states that we spoke about earlier, which is just X, the X position of the cart, X, X dot, uh, and then we have theta of the pendulum angle, and then we have theta, theta dot, right? Which is the uh, pendulum angular velocity. So those four uh, states were basically feeding back through a gain factor K. Uh, it's a matrix multiplication. So basically this K is a one by four matrix, and we're multiplying it by a four by one matrix uh, of the states, which will then give us a one by one matrix, right? Or just a constant value, which we can then feed into this um, summing block here. And then we've got the reference set point, which is also one by four. And then we'll actually multiply that in a little bit. You'll see, we'll multiply that by a precompensator um, n bar, which is um, four by one, which we'll end up again, when we do matrix multiplication, we'll end up with a one by one matrix, which we can then subtract from that, from this uh, state, the, the feedback value basically, or the controller value. And that will give us a single voltage command to send to the motor. So how I've done this is I've basically followed along what MathWorks had done. I hadn't done anything particularly special. They have just modeled the pendulum, uh, the sort of cart and the pendulum alone. They have not modeled anything with the drive command um, in the state space anyway. So they have done, they've done this state space model with just the cart and the pendulum. And I, what I found is I've actually used back their same K parameter, the same K uh, matrix. Um, so once you've put it in the state space, you then effectively define your weights uh, that I spoke about earlier. Um, and then you can just use this LQR command, which will then compute the, the K matrix, uh, the K gain matrix for you. And I have actually ended up using back there, this exact same K uh, gains for the, for these, uh, for these um, weights basically. And how I knew I could do that, actually, and this is where the modeling actually came in useful, is because when I looked at the model, um, once I validated it, I noticed that um, effectively, the, the voltage was almost quite equivalent to the force being applied. Um, so the blue line is the force and the yellow line is actually voltage. So it's just a bit, it just lags a bit behind, but it's also and it's also just scaled. So I figured that from that, from that knowledge, um, I figured that using the, K, the same K matrix um, effectively would have given me a really good starting point to work with. 
um, and in fact it did and their key matrix actually worked well with my my pendulum as well um, you also then need to as I mentioned previously you need to compute this n bar which is uh, just a scale precompensator to put a dereference um, so once you do that you'll end up with this sort of control structure uh, you'll see we've got the four state feedback terms and that is um, matrix multiplied by the k gain matrix and this is the k gain matrix that we've got from MathWorks uh, website um, so it's effectively just multiplying x position by this value x dot by this value and adding them um, theta b by this value and adding it and so on uh, and the same thing happens with the uh, with the reference set point the only thing different really is that I had a pi here instead of a zero uh, from compared to math MathWorks because my my when my pendulum is upright that angle is pi rather than rather than zero which means that in my in my n bar my n bar is not just a single value it's a, well it'll be a four it'll be a uh, one by four matrix so, uh, so if and I've just put this 105 here or here from the k gain matrix into the n bar uh, matrix here so that will that will uh, compensate for that for that gain in the k matrix and from there that's that's basically what you can do and that is basically all I did for the controller design and then because I had a good model of it and I tried it out and it and it worked it actually worked on the hardware as well so one of the things I would like to cover as a sort of um, retrospect take a bit of a retrospective on the project um, there's a few things that I would have liked to probably do in this uh, uh, with this project which I don't think I will be carrying it forward with uh, one of them is I'd like to be able to you know do a bit of disturbance rejection analysis so basically I'll be able to touch the pendulum a little bit more than I did and hope and try to get it to, to, to be very tight with the control I didn't really tune the controllers that much I hardly really tuned it, um, but I think there's a lot more tuning that I could do to get it a bit tighter so that I can do a bit of disturbance rejection on it. The other thing is, you know, the stand is not the greatest. It is, you kind of just have to like hang it off the edge of a table, which is really not necessarily ideal. So I would have liked to maybe construct something out of wood that you can, that is also fairly portable that I can carry around as well fairly easily, but I didn't get the chance to do that either. Um, you can also put in some limit switches as well inside of there, but I, I, I mean, because you've got the, the hard, the soft limit uh, faults and a fault accommodation in there, it's not really needed, but it would have been a nice thing to put in as well. And then finally, the biggest disadvantage to this entire project is that it is really noisy. It's very, very noisy on the way up, which on when it's up in upright control. Um, I think you can improve that if you use some different types of gears um, that sort of, I think, so there's, there's gears that mesh a little bit like they're, they're not, they're not like these spur gears. Spur gears are typically very noisy, but if you use some alternative type of gear, it might reduce the noise quite significantly, but I also didn't get an opportunity to do that. So I just wanted to cover some of the disadvantages basically of what I've done in this project. So that's it for this video series. I hope this was valuable to you. I did see a lot of videos on inverted pendulums on YouTube out there already, um, but I found that a lot of them just kind of demonstrate how it works, but they don't actually get into the detail of how it's constructed and how you would model it and design these controllers. So I hope that this was, this did add some value to you if this was something that you were thinking about building or wanted to build at some point. Um, so that's it. And uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in a future video I suppose that I'll make on something else. I think I've got a VTOL that I'm hopefully working on uh, that should be out in the next couple months. So thanks again and I'll see you in the next video.